Hey guys, I'm here uh, in Kuching, Malaysia, and you can see that this is a beautiful mosque. It's brand new. Uh, there's another government building right behind me. I'm not sure if you can see it very well, but that one's really beautiful. It's got a, a design that I haven't seen before. Um, and you know, you know, when you're in Southeast Asia, um, you know, a lot of it is really interesting because there's an overlap between communism, religion, Islam, uh, Japanese occupation, British occupation. So it's very difficult to figure out what's, you know, what's going on or what happened. And one of the things that happened is that, you know, Suharto um, in Indonesia, uh, right around, I believe, the 1950s and 60s, uh, right around the time, of course, that the Western empires uh, were flailing uh, domestically because of opposition to a Vietnam. Right around that time, you had this, you know, anti-colonial movement all over Asia. And part of that, of course, was the fact that World War II, a lot of that, a lot of the, a lot of the sores uh, were not fully resolved. Um, for example, the Dutch promised to leave uh, here, uh, no, sorry, in Indonesia, uh, in 1945, they were still there in 1950. They, were, they promised to leave by 1946. They'd been here uh, for hundreds of, hundreds of years. Uh, they kicked out the Portuguese uh, before them in Indonesia. And so uh, it's kind of an interesting situation because you see the, the inefficacy of the United Nations to the point where they couldn't even, you know, take out the ask for the removal of the Dutch, um, you know, in anywhere, really. Um, and of course, that tells you right away that you had a, a situation that was untenable because you had reformacy, reform basically, uh, and, and confrontation. And all of that was, was the British Empire trying to figure out how to remove itself financially and ethically uh, from, all of, from its empire while handing off security concerns uh, to the American Empire right around the 1960s. And of course, the American Empire suffered a setback in Vietnam when it lost uh, that war. So the question is, you know, with Malaysia's relationship with Indonesia and Singapore uh, is quite interesting because the British actually wanted to colonize Malaysia as well. And you'll notice a lot of, you know, British architecture uh, that's changing, obviously. Um, but, you know, depending on where you go, like Ipoh, you'll notice a lot you know, more Chinese and British architecture. It just really depends on what city you go to. And so the question really is, how did Singapore come about? Singapore was, came about in 1965 um, when the British realized that Suharto, you know, they couldn't justify another war in Malaysia. So Suharto had calculated correctly that by attacking Malaysia, he would kick out the British. He wanted to be the prime example of a flourishing empire uh, that would set an example for everyone else. And in fact, what's really interesting is uh, that a Singapore that became that more manageable, you know, not an empire, but an example. And so the British, you know, basically decided that they couldn't justify uh, occupation or expansion or within Malaysia, allowed that to be ceded uh, to the anti-colonial empires or the anti-colonial movement. And at that point, retreated to Singapore. What's really interesting is that the founder of Singapore uh, LKY wasn't really a fan of the British. He, you know, he basically uh, told himself and, and, and his people that whatever the British are doing, we can do ourselves. So within this framework, you've got this, this you know, port in Singapore uh, that did better than everyone else because the economy at the time uh, revolved, around, revolved around shipping. Now, it should have revolved around shipping in Malaysia and Indonesia also because obviously they have ports. So why was it that Singapore became the leader? Um, and I think that's a question that a lot of us, you know, you know try to ask ourselves. And, and, and part of it is just innovation. Part of it is financial. Um, you know, the Singaporeans were able to um, get the technology they needed, um, partly because, they, you know, they had the best shipbuilders. They figured out how to move up the supply chain into repairing ships, filling ships with oil quickly. And they became the central point. Uh, part of it was also it was a free port. Initially, they did not charge anybody for coming in. So they built, they built up a customer base. Uh, by giving away their strategic location for free, um, although they did have taxes. In other words, you, you know, if you came in, 
um, you know, you had a tariff, you know, depending on how, what you offloaded and what you, um, you know, decided to keep for yourself or, you know, keep, keep on going through that transit point, including opium, by the way, that was, you know, just a regular sort of, you know, drug, a, a commerce, part of commerce back in the day. So, you know, you look around now and you realize, you know, what's, what's happening here? Are we, are we finally seeing the vestiges of Western colonialism go away? Uh, because it's clearly, you know, from 1945 until 2001, uh, it was clearly a situation where the former British colonies uh, had figured out, um, at least in Southeast Asia, uh, you know, how to, how to get that technology to move up the supply chain. So India has terrible infrastructure, um, but, you know, for, from a technological standpoint, it didn't manage to kick out the British interests. Uh, you know, right now, <clears throat> obviously, they still speak English. Um, but also you've got a situation where, you know, they kept that technology. And so in order to do that, um, you know, you have to, you know, not have, you have to have a moderation sort of a reaction to the British occupation. So for example, in Indonesia, <clears throat> the British, you know, had a battle in Surabaya, overreacted uh, when the Indonesians uh, asserted their independence and, you know, essentially created a situation where nobody, whether it was Dutch I mean, the Dutch actually tried to raise the flag in Surabaya right after World War II, which was over in 1945. Um, and, you know, obviously the Indonesians didn't like that very much. They actually managed to kick out the Dutch um, just by using uh, bamboo, sharpened bamboo sticks, uh, which, you know, is quite a sight, I'm sure. Um, but, you know, you fast forward and you wonder, you know, where all this is going, because when, they, when the Dutch were kicked out, they were kicked out completely. So they took their money with them, their banking with them, um, and now you notice that, you know, the mobile technology, a lot of that is coming in from places that kept their ties to the former empire, uh, which meant that they had to allow them to stay in some capacity. You look at Iraq with the American empire on, the, on, its, you know, on its way down, right? That, that would be the modern Vietnam. Um, and so you look at that country where right around 2005, 2006, the um, plan was for a slow withdrawal of military troops and then a re replacement of that uh, of those forces with locally trained Iraqis. Uh, the idea being that you wanted an independent state, not somebody that was hostile um, or, or, or overly um, you know, obsequious to either the United States or to uh, Iran. Today, um, you know, in, in 2020, you, know, you can see that after you know, 13 years of promising a you know independence for Iraq. You can see that right now we are in a situation where um, it's very difficult for former you know, colonies or current colonies to divorce themselves from you know their former you know sort of financial and military ties. And so the question is clearly that you know the United States failed; it lost credibility. And the question is how much of that had a cascading effect in Syria. And, and all the other fronts, Lebanon, that they, that, they, that they and their proxies were engaged in. Um, but what does that have to do with Malaysia? Um, the question really is that you have a, a situation where you have this, you know, this swirl, swirling, these swirling forces of anti-communism, anti-colonialism, socialism, capitalism, all these things swarming together. And when you visit today, what you're looking at is perhaps for the first time, the ability to free yourselves from the past. And how is Malaysia going to, you know, sort of get there? Um, it's a good question, but part of it has to be control of, of technology in order to have its own financial system. And the question is, how do you do that? Is ASEAN the answer? Uh, because if it is going to be ASEAN for financial technology, Singapore is still the leader. Um, and is that going to work out for Malaysia? Um, and, you know, the whole thing is really interesting. It's something to think about, but hopefully I've given you a little bit of a background um, on how to at least approach all these issues. So again, uh, Singapore exists because Suharto attacked Malaysia, um, primarily Borneo. Um, the British realized due to domestic opposition at home that they couldn't continue to, to hold on to, the, to their empire, tried to cede it to the Americans. Uh, the Americans, of course, were bogged down in Vietnam. Uh, and so the Singaporeans figured out they had to do it those themselves. Uh, they managed to create a situation that was, that was very good for themselves, primarily because they had fantastic politicians, uh, you know, LKY, uh, To, Go, all those leaders. Uh, and today the question is, how does Singapore uh, and Malaysia, how do they get along so that they benefit themselves moving forward? And, how, and the same thing with Indonesia. How, do these, how does ASEAN move forward?